Well, hello and welcome to TPI. I'm in the charming city of Portsmouth in Virginia. On today's show, a young woman who searched for love leads her to a life of drug abuse and prostitution. Plus a young man on a mission to break the cycle of depression and suicide on black men. It's TPI starts now. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Muiwa. I'm here at the coffee shop in downtown Portsmouth, Virginia. And the barrister told me to try a Trust Me and Latte. Let me see if I've been led astray. Now, I don't normally drink this stuff, but here we go. Mm. Not bad. A great way to start off the show. Now, first up, in the early days of the fashion industry, models of color were non-existent until one woman challenged what was thought to be the standard of beauty and changed everything. Ephraim Graham brings us this story. I always know you can change things. I've done it before. Who is Beth Ann Hardison? I started recognizing that she was this force of nature and this almost like philosopher. And then after the process of making the film, going deeper into the story, um, of what she had actually done, how she had conducted her life, I became a little shy of her because I was, I became really impressed. <laughs> Everyone's talking about diversity and inclusion. That directly stems from the work that Beth Ann did. Without her, the opportunities wouldn't exist for me to do what I love. She's like a second mother to me. That one shining light of kindness. How mm -hmm. difficult was it to navigate um, how this story would be told? It was a very organic process, and I think that was a result of, you know, deciding to work together as opposed to me doing a portrait of Beth Ann. It was like us both co-directing, and I thought, you know, by collaborating, it would be it would be a human adventure. I would be able to go deeper with Beth Ann, and I would, and it really did. We're all students of Beth Ann Hardison. You heard it first. She didn't want to be front and center, but she came to the realization that's kind of, um, she she had to she had to and she um she didn't think she had a story if you can believe it like she didn't really think <laughs> there was a story to tell she's the godmother of fashion when i saw it i was the first black black looking model on 7th avenue there was no people look like me i knew the difference of segregation from childhood these people thought that we were less I let them know we are here. I, I got a chance to talk to your co-director and one of the things that he said that surprised me was, you didn't think you had a story to tell. Well, if you, you know, if, <laughs> if you're a real true just soldier, you're just a soldier, you're doing the work. Mm. You don't sit around thinking, oh my God, this is so amazing. Someone should do a documentary about this. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> you're hoping that you make that move that works. You, you hope that you can make a difference. You know in your heart you can. You're counting on those that you're sort of like speaking to. But you know, um, but at the same time, you don't think that, you know, until I saw all the footage, he sent it to me, he was so nervous. He said, I, I promise it. I, that was a moment I knew that we accepted, you know, now I know you made me a believer. She realized she was the message. She represents this power. One of the things you said at the very beginning that touched me is you seem to, always know that you could change things. And I'm curious, where did that come from that you felt, I can change it, I can change it? At some point, you just know that this is your journey. A lot of designers did not use models of color. No Blacks, no ethnics. You don't know what it's like to be invisible. Where are the Black girls? You made strides and then sort of departed the modeling industry, if you will, and then watch things fall apart. What was it like to see that you made this progress and it seems like things just went in reverse in your absence? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it just wasn't even in my, it's just that the game changed, that the mm. industry changed. So all of a sudden, uh, designers were hiring outside people like stylists. But you could see that the people who are doing it 
don't recognize what they're doing. Mm. They don't see it. They don't see it like I'm seeing it or like people of color that are in the industry are seeing it. All of a sudden, you were there before, now you're being erased. She moved our glamour and our good looks into the arena of activism. She's a game changer. She sacrificed a lot. What inside <laughs> you made you want to be an activist? What made you decide, okay, I've done Oh, that. I don't want to be an activist. Oh, no, no. Oh, my dear. I didn't, you know, want to be an activist or, you know, an advocacy or anything. You just, you know, I knew I had the audience because people in the industry respected me. Mm. And I knew that I could say things because I believed in them. My mother has enough ambition for the whole world. It's really hard as a single mom. I was scared to fail. But she wants us to win more than anything. It gets a little challenging at times. But that's going to be part of your great story. I was telling someone, I said, well, you know, I've, I've known of her and, and followed her. But then I watched the film, I was like, wow, there was so much I just didn't know. <laughs> the people who've known me for 25, 30 years didn't know that stuff. I just want wow. you to know that you're you're in you're in the majority of the company because practically everyone who's seen the film really didn't know all that. I don't know who I think I am, but I do be trying. Do you have a wish for the audience or a hope or takeaway that they'll get? I, I hope that people um understand the history. I feel like so many people come out of the film saying like, I, I had no idea. I had no idea that this happened. I had no idea that the fashion world had gone through this, um, you know, racist practices. I'm not here to put anyone down. I'm here to bring everybody up. Without Beth Ann just having these press conferences and just kind of making everyone uh, aware of that history, of where it had been and where it needed to go. The history will just repeat itself. Once you meet this person, it's going to change your life. Let's shake it up. Hey Amen. Sometimes you have to shake things up. The world is waiting on you to make a difference. You can watch Invisible Beauty on Apple TV. Stay with us because after the break, a young woman is promised a life she could only dream about. However, finds herself in a nightmare. I was disgusted with myself. He had painted this picture of what life could be like, you know, this glamorous life. I really hated myself. It actually took me into a deeper depression because it was like, I have myself in something that I don't even know how to get out of. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Welcome back. Mary Hooks had everything she needed to be successful. Growing up, she excelled in school and had a loving and supportive family. However, the negative words of others infiltrated her aunt and took her down a path of destruction. Here's her story. You don't fit in with us. You're an outcast. You're a black sheep. You're too skinny. You're not pretty enough. Everything that they were saying to me, it would replay over and over in my head. I would hear all of this stuff, and instead of like lashing out, I would just bottle it up in the inside. Mary Hooks was in middle school when the bullying started. She made good grades and was involved in sports. However, her small size made her the object of ridicule. If that wasn't bad enough, she felt her efforts went unnoticed by her busy parents. I knew that my parents loved me without a doubt, but they did not show me any attention because they were working so hard to provide for me and my siblings. So at 13, Mary decided to ditch her good girl image and started hanging out with the cool kids, skipping school and smoking marijuana. 
the attention thing became an addiction. Once I started to feel the affection that I was longing for, it was like, yes, I want to be here with these people because these people are showing me that they love me, they care about me, you know, they're having conversation with me, they're not too busy for me. It wasn't long before Mary was having sex. Then at 15, she got pregnant. I was dying on the inside because I was holding on to all of this frustration and confusion because as a child, I'm, I'm now a mom. During her pregnancy, Mary stopped partying. That, however, changed after giving birth to her daughter when Mary slipped into depression. The smoking, drinking, and sex was taking me away from reality. It's a, it's a high. You're in another place, and in that place, it feels good for the moment. And so you try to stay in that place as much as you can to forget about what's really going on. Then at 17, Mary met a man who promised her the world, giving her the attention and affirmation she was looking for. He was affirming me in ways that I had never been affirmed before, um, just showing me affection. It wasn't sexual with him. It was just, you are beautiful. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Things like that just did something to my self-esteem because that's what I was lacking. Which made Mary an easy target. Under his influence, Mary would become an exotic dancer and eventually a prostitute. What money she could keep went to support her daughter and her growing drug habit. It gave me that sense of numbness. When you're high, everything that's bad, it doesn't seem bad. You're just floating around. I was disgusted with myself, but he had painted this picture of what life could be like. You know, this, this glamorous life, this life of a fairy tale. And so wanting that, and wanting to, you know, continue to feel loved and accepted by him, I really hated myself. It actually took me into a deeper depression because it was like, I have myself in something that I don't even know how to get out of. After graduating high school, Mary spent the next three years trapped in the sex trade, afraid to leave and addicted to alcohol and ecstasy. All along, she knew she was destroying her life as well as her daughter's. And I would be in the hotel and I would just cry and I would just cry, and I was like, I have really let her down. You know, mm, I would think, I have really let my baby down, and there's nothing I can do to get out of this situation. She also knew she was disappointing God. My dad always talked about the Lord. He always told me, like, Jesus loves you and things like that, but I knew that I was outside the will of God, but I didn't know how to get out. Then one night, high on pot, Mary says she heard a voice. And the voice said to me, why are you doing this? Do you see how you're hurting yourself? Do you see how you're hurting your daughter? It was the voice of God Say, look at you, Mary. This is not what I designed for you. This is not what I have for you. That week, Mary started going to church. She also cut all ties with the man as she worked hard to get off drugs and alcohol. However, still a single mom, there was one thing missing in Mary's life. So when an old boyfriend got out of jail, she decided to rekindle that relationship. I still wanted somebody. I still wanted attention. So I was like, okay, God, you stay there. I'm gonna enjoy my relationship and this family that I'm trying to build on my own. And then when I need you, I'll come back and pick you up. So just kind of putting God to the side. However, this man was an abusive alcoholic who pulled her right back into drinking. They had a son, and for a year, Mary struggled to find peace. I would, um, you know, still go to church on Sundays, but then I would leave church and then I would go drink. So I wanted the love and attention from him, which was not a believer. Um, but then I also had felt the love of God and I knew that God was calling me higher in him. Finally, in 2017, she had him arrested for domestic violence and left with her kids, never looking back. But I got to a place of God, everything that I try to do in my own power is not working. And so I need you to fully take control and I don't know what that looks like, and I don't know where it's gonna lead me, but I trust you and I need you to have your way. Mary rededicated her life to Jesus and was baptized. I fully surrender and I just shut down from talking to men and just solely focus on my relationship with Christ. I was filling myself up with the word of God. And so God was affirming me through his word. And so the affection that I was looking for within people, God was giving me that without a physical person. Today, Mary is a life coach, helping people experience the true grace and acceptance she's found through a relationship with Jesus. Now I see myself as a beautiful woman of God, 
I see myself for who God sees me as, that I am a masterpiece, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't care how nasty or filthy or dirty your past is. I don't care what kind of mistakes you have made. Um, surrender to God and he will make you a new creation in him. Amen. Mary believed the lies of the devil that no one cared about her, that she was ugly, which took her life down a direction God never intended for her. Friend, go to the one who created you. Only the maker of a thing can declare what it is. This is what God says about you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says he loves you with an everlasting love. He says he has a plan and purpose for your life. The Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar. So if anyone says the opposite of what he declared, don't allow it to take root in your heart. Have you allowed the negative words of others or even yourself break you down? Do you need Jesus to come in and give you a brand new start? If you answered yes, say these words with me. We're going to pray together. But say these words with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I need you. I confess Jesus that without you, my life would be empty. And I ask you, give me a brand new start. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters who have said this prayer. I ask you to do what would blow their minds to let them know that you are real and you're not just a story and a book. You are a person sitting, waiting to embrace them with your love. Amen. If you pray the prayer of salvation, please message us on WhatsApp. We have prayer counselors who can share more with you about your decision to follow Christ. Also, someone will pray with you and answer any questions that you might have. Now, for our viewers in North America and Europe, you can call us using the number on your screen. You can also find our contact details on our website. Don't go anywhere because after the break, we meet a young man on a mission to end depression and suicide among black men. We'll be right back. Call us at 0300-140-0067 or visit cbneurope.com forward slash TPI. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Welcome back. In 2021, Brenton Sims lost his job and found himself in deep depression. Through soul searching therapy and prayer, he developed the Black Boy Joy Fest to help other men learn how to handle stress and mental health issues. Brenton, welcome to TPI. Oh, thank you for having me. So Black Boy Joy Fest, where did, what's that? Where, and I, I understand it came from your experiences, Yeah. but why that name? Uh, I feel like there is a, a young person in all of us, right? Um, and so Black Boy Joy Fest, that name is super intentional because I believe that it addresses the, the little boy inside of us, right? That always needs to be cared for and nurtured. And so Black Boy Joy Fest is a space that does just that. It cares for and it nurtures the, the little boy inside of all of the grown men that we see, right? So t t tell me about your journey through the things I just mentioned in terms of 
the loss of job to a place of depression. Yeah. What was happening? Paint a picture for us. Yeah, absolutely. Just as a, as a young 20-something year old uh, in the middle of his career, uh, I experienced a church split. I was a youth pastor at a, at a Presbyterian church. Um, I was there for about two years and I watched this church go through a really, really horrendous split. Um, and it made me really question if I believed in God or not, if, 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 if I still wanted to follow this faith. Um, and through that journey of me losing my job and losing my community, I experienced a really, really uh, a deep depression. And through that, um, I was able to really find ways that um, helped me heal um, outside of the church, right? Because my faith would, was being challenged. And so in that space, I just sought out different ways to heal myself, whether it had been therapy, whether it had been yoga, whether um, it had been just spending more time by myself praying to the Lord. Um, I tried everything to just make sure that I was healthy to go into the next season of my life. Now, you, you mentioned yoga, and we'll, we'll explore that in, in a moment, uh, but you were youth, youth pastor, and by the way, just very quickly, did, did your young people ever say to you, oh, but you look like Marley Music? Young people call me a lot of things. <laughs> they say they said a lot of things, but I don't. I, they never uh, compare me to Molly Music, but I have gotten that before. Okay, so so Molly's uh, is now for uh, older folks like myself. I wasn't gonna say that. Well, you know, I, I embrace it. <laughs> I embrace it. <laughs> I embrace it. So so you you start talking about your your experience and and depression. Uh, that's not typical in the black culture. It's not typical in some of our churches because you're a man of faith. You should, you know, confess the Lord, confess positivity. Right. So for you, where did you find the clarity of mind to say, I'm depressed? And what advantage did that give you to open up your mouth and say it? Well, really the thing that motivated me to go on the journey was, do you believe your life still matters? And uh, do you believe that it still matters enough to like try different resources to help, you know, save yourself? And so from that, what was my, was a clear answer. You know, your, your, your faith community is going through a hard time right now. That's okay, right? But uh, what are you gonna do to take responsibility and accountability over your situation? Um, are you gonna go to therapy? Are you gonna talk to people? Are you gonna be in community? And so, um, I was able to kind of let go of what we would call tradition, right? Um, and let go of, of this box that really limited us from exploring different resources to, to help heal. Uh, I tell you, what, I so much want to ask you about what you do when, because mm. people go through church split all the time. People go through relationship splits. They, they go to university and mm -hmm. old friends don't talk to them anymore and all that. But let me get to this yoga thing mm -hmm. because you have this resource yeah. for, for men that's going well, uh, but it's yoga. Mm -hmm. Now for some people, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let me channel some, some of my Nigerian. Ah, yoga, mm -hmm. there's a spirit behind it. Prenton, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I always tell people I have the spirit of God. So what I do, um, I'm always checking with my father first. Um, and I can understand the, you know, the the confusion around it right because most people who practice this resource they come from a different um you know a different religion a different uh place of faith and just like everything like prayer it's like well who are you praying to right as for me i'm praying <laughs> to god the father right um and so that's that same approach with, that i took when it came to yoga um i'm checking with my father and i'm making sure that my foundation is set in him before i move forward in any resource so there's something of you uh redeeming yoga from what people have made it to be evil to actually this is a god-given thing to to use to to set people free yeah absolutely i think i have a a cool place in culture to be able to usher in um non-traditional things right as a young person as a man of faith um and to be able to say like hey everything is bad but where's the foundation you know of of this thing that you're using to express right um where where's your heart right are you are you practicing this to um, connect with another being outside of God? Wrong, right? Um, but are you using this to really connect with your, your spirit, to quiet your body, right? To feel what's happening? Um, that's what I use. So, so typically for someone like you, there's a lot of admin you have to do. There's a lot of work that goes into what you, what you do. 
And I'm sure there'd be moments where you thought, oh my goodness, why am I doing this? Uh, are there any stories of people who have come to Black Boy Joy Fest and you've seen what it's done for them, how it's turned them around, that's made you think, yeah, this is why I'm doing this, that's encouraged you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I host a round table every month. Uh, it's called I See You, Bro. Um, and it's a space where we just open up conversation around taboo topics, right? That black men never really talk about our relationships with our father, like what we would describe as a man. We talk about healthy sexuality and masculinity. And in those spaces, we're able to just open up and talk about and deconstruct some of the ideas that are actually wrong. Um, and I've seen so many men uh, be healed from that and be so excited to start this journey because they don't have the space. A lot of men just really need space to talk and to bounce ideas off of one another. We're taught to just be quiet. We're taught to just shut up. We're taught to just be stoic, right? Um, but providing those spaces where men are able to be open and healthy, it creates this like, this effect of, hey, you're gonna be okay. Brenton, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, we reached the end of the show. I'd like to thank city officials of Portsmouth and to Tiffany and Lamar Linton, the owners of the coffee shop for welcoming us into their shop. Now remember, you can watch this and all our episodes on YouTube and also on our website. Please like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We have encouraging content and intriguing conversations for you as well. We leave you today with some music from Zaria Zachary and Bethany Wall titled Simple Ways. More of us at TPI. Goodbye and God bless you. You are the endless well Deep enough to reach past The bottom of the ocean floor With no limits yeah. Makes me want to slow down What I got to worry about I know you always got this Always got this So let's go back to simple ways let's not make it complicated and celebrate i don't want to miss out right now the way you first loved me jesus take me right back to the simple way simple way feels good to be honest So good to breathe again I've been holding on for too long It's not meant to be this heavy Cause your burden is easy Let's go back to the simple ways Let's not make